Let me start this morning by a, a big overview of the next today and the next two Sundays. We're, we're going to discuss six sermons and we're discussing them in chronological order. And so I call today early sermons because we're going to talk about two sermons before the I Have a Dream speech. One is his first recorded sermon, and that was in Detroit. And then the second one is at Dexter uh, Baptist Church, which is his first place that he was at Montgomery, Alabama, and the bus boycott made Montgomery famous, and the minister's group that led that, and he was elected the chair of that, and then I can say the rest is history. So uh, the uh, thing I would like to do today is uh, when we're looking at these three uh, sessions, is first define the sermon and to, to get grasp what I think is very important. The sermon does not stand alone, and yet we're going to talk about it standing alone. You have to understand that the sermon is part of a service. Uh, it's a, to me, uh, it is an essential part. It's the way we define services by having sermons, and that the sermon is given by a specific person. Uh, an agent uh, uh, in my rhetorical terms, but it's the clergy person, uh, somebody in our church, which is ordained in other churches, they may or may not be, have had any particular back training. The sermon is uh, uh, also, as we learned from the first two presentations, when looking at I Have a Dream, it's part of a context. And that context is a particular time in the life of the congregation. We have a sense of readings that are on a three-year cycle, um, and that, that becomes important. Uh, when I'm at church, I'm Don Boilo, an individual listener, and yet I'm part of the community of that church. In other words, the congregation is, is my major aspect. And so, when we're talking about sermons, an important part is the attitude of the receiver. And if, uh, I remember my dad, uh, when I went to church with him, when I was a small boy, he would sit and twiddle his thumbs. And I was amazed because he had twiddle them two different ways. One would be forward and the other would be backward. And I, I never did figure out the rhythm to whatever was being said, but I'd watch his fingers more than I'd watch his, listen to the sermon. Um, how we respond to the sermon uh, depends upon your knowledge of the gospel or scripture, or theology, all help you. And uh, the other thing that helps me a lot is my age. Uh, so that means I've listened to a lot of sermons in a lot of different places. <laughs> and so, uh, it, it's an important part of understanding us. And so uh, my secondary theme besides Martin Luther King is I'm going to talk about listening to sermons, uh, the skills that you have to analyze aspects of the sermon and to establish what you're going to remember. The person giving the sermon has a sense of credibility and that that is developed before the sermon uh, when you hire somebody it's important uh, the credibility of that person may or change it rarely does but it goes up or down depending upon the specifics of that sermon and the person giving it makes a whole series of choices um, some, some, when you're talking about doing sermons, you might get advice. It takes two days of the five days of uh, before the church service. Uh, people do it longer. A, a very, my, my debate coach in college wrote a book about, for, for preachers about giving sermons. He argued that the entire time you're living, you're always preparing for a sermon. And so he, he says it's, your whole life as you're preparing for a sermon because you choose content, you choose an organizational scheme, you choose the way you deliver, uh, 
and the style, meaning the language that enhances that credibility. So the basic choices, and, and we're going to, I'm running over these very quickly, but I'll be referring to them over the next three set, over these three sessions. Content is the beginning point. It helps us to understand the ideas, the examples, the support, the words. Um, Aristotle and Plato talked about it as the invention process, the creation of the sermon. Uh, delivery skills of the presenter, volume, rate, action, eye contact, other spatial movements, all sorts of things are, are part of uh, what makes what we call an effective sermon. Uh, the structure of the speech. Now, often the structure is not uh, clear, uh, but you can have a topical, which is the most common. You can have chronological, you can have problem solution. There's a whole variety of different approaches to that. We subconsciously analyze that. Uh, a, a funny statement for those of you who remember when David Jones was our preacher, that's when I joined Good Shepherd. Uh, when David said, in conclusion, you knew you had another 10 minutes, a whole other theme was going to come up, and you might as well just settle in. Don't get ready for the end of the sermon, because that was his signal. <laughs> and, uh, there, there's other funny stories like that. Uh, I, I was glad to join Good Shepherd, and David was part of the, the appeal. Um, the length of the sermon, it varies by denomination and, and, and the person giving it. And so you often have uh, priests being judged by short, pe pe short meaning that they're short sermons. And uh, like our present uh, a priest who's an interim is, gives very short sermons. And so it will be hard for the next person coming back to go back to the longer sermon sort of to, be able to deal with that. But these are all choices. So now we have a sense of Martin Luther King. Before we start the specific sermons, I wanted to share some research by a woman named Hamlet. And she identified four aspects of preaching in the black church. And these are dramatic storytelling, identification of heroes, poetic diction and rhythm, and the call and response interaction with the listeners. We'll, we'll talk about a couple of these uh, today as we begin to look at the presentation. Okay, so this speech, this sermon of rediscovering lost values, it's part of what I call early king. Um, he was given at the Second Baptist Church in Detroit, Michigan on the 28th of February, 1954. Eisenhower was president, Queen Elizabeth had just been installed Mount Everest had been climbed, and therefore, as humans, we thought, now we've done everything, we can climb Mount Everest. Uh, Shah takes over in Iran. The Korean War had ended, and we still have Jim Crow laws. And you could go on and on to define that context. This is what the church looks like, uh, a red brick church, uh, very common. You, it, It's on a... Uh, a piece of property downtown Detroit. It's still there. It's still an active church. So they invited Martin Luther King Jr., who was a student at Boston University in the doctoral program. And what is important, they, they invited him knowing about his heritage. Uh, his great-grandfather, Willis Williams, uh, was one of the major organizers of small black churches in the South post-Civil War. In other words, the beginning of freedom. These, you're now responsible for your church. His grandfather was A.D. Williams, who in 1895 um, helped this, uh, found the uh, Baptist church and the, particularly the, the churches emphasizing for blacks. And his father was Daddy King, who was one of the most famous preachers in American history at that time. And he grew up listening to Daddy uh, and, uh, give sermons uh, at, there in Atlanta. And he, he has this long tradition. He also heard his grandfather. So he, he knew what great preaching was about. And so uh, that's a context. So he has credibility. And I just wanted to 
to know that that credibility was why he was invited to preach in Detroit. The sermon that he talked about and he let them know would be on rediscovering, rediscovering the lost values. And so two ways to think about a sermon and what I'm gonna to do today for both of them is talk about the theme and talk about the gospel story. So in listening to sermons, if you say to yourself, at the end of the sermon, can I have a sense of what the theme is? And I wanna know what the scriptural basis or the gospel story. Uh, and again, going back to my experience at Good Shepherd, some of you will remind that we had uh, a real balance. Uh, David Jones was very scripturally related and it often, most often talked about the gospel. And then his associate uh, would talk about applying things in, in current uh, life. In fact, we had a question, we, Good Shepherd had a question uh, that we surveyed the church when we were looking for, uh, at when David went into the bishop's uh, uh, position, uh, when we looked for a new one, and, and in that we had, uh, I, I wrote the question, that's how I know about it. We, we asked, what kind of a, a sermon do you want? And Good Shepherd was split 48-52 about whether or not it should be applying to current life or whether or not it should be based on the gospel. So uh, Good Shepherd has its roots right in the middle of the road. And so <laughs> in terms of preaching, you, 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 that's a little aspect. I don't know where we are today. But anyway, try to understand what is the scriptural theological basis of the sermon. Now, another thing to remember is an image. And uh, here are two types of things uh, that uh, Martin Luther King Jr. talked about and I think were great. He starts out in the beginning and noting that I am not going to put my ultimate faith in the little gods that can be destroyed in an atomic age. Now that reminds you that in 54, most of us uh, when in school, we had duck and uh, duck under the desk exercises in case of atomic attack somewhere so that we would be ready. We were, uh, war was still part of the ethos of the United States at that time. And notice his emphasis on little gods that can be destroyed in an atomic age. And so what you're gonna find is he's gonna talk about materialism in this sermon. Um, and his, the image that he wants us to remember is us. And he says, the thing that we need in the world today is a group of men, oops, I said mean, it's men and women who will stand up for right and be opposed to wrong, whatever it is. And so, that becomes that image of right and wrong, and, and it's a dichotomy that becomes an important part of the sermon. The lost values. He talks about two primary lost values and then gives us a visualization, in other words, an image to try to think about these two. The first is, his argument is, the value we need to rediscover is that the universe hinges on a moral foundation. It is not based on materialism. And we need to rediscover the principle that there is a God behind the process. And the image he wants us to remember, and I think this is a great one, automobiles and subways, televisions and radios, collars and dollars and cents can never be a substitute for God. Well, I'm having trouble with spelling today. Um, and anyway, that the key aspect is this image that the material things, houses, cars, uh, vacations, are not a substitute for God. And that go, goes back to we need to get from God the moral foundation. Now, in the dramatic storytelling, he uses this aspect from the gospel. Uh, we need to turn around and go back to the old values. And to remind us that, he talks uh, quite a bit about the story of the 12-year-old Jesus teaching in the temple after his parents, realizing that he was lost, returned to Jerusalem to find him. So the gospel um, is based on this story of 
uh, when when they after uh, being in Jerusalem, they leave the whole group, and as the group leaves, uh, uh, Joseph is in front, and Mary is on is on a donkey and back with the women, and the kids are supposedly behind that, and they just assume Jesus was there. And when one gospel we get, it's a day and a half before they realize he's gone. Immediately, immediately they turn around. And he stresses that to go back to find him. He says that every parent would go back. That's what we do as parents. And we need to do that as people with our Christianity is to rediscover these values, that moral foundation. Um, here's a wonderful sense of what he's saying. There's two phrases, two, two things from his sermon that I'm quoting here. But I'm here to say to you this morning that some things are right and some things are wrong. Uh, the parentheses is the call and response. Somebody yelled out in the middle of the church, yes. Eternally so, absolutely so, it's wrong to hate. Yes, that's right. We'll get hate in the next sermon about the fourth one. It's wrong in America. It's wrong in Germany. It's wrong in Russia. It's wrong in China. And then the response, Lord help him. And so in this series, and you, we, we noted that in his I Have a Dream speech, how he uses this repetition, he uses parallel structure. And so the, these are aspects of good, uh, good presentation and speaking. So that was uh, the first sermon. And I want to move to the second one, which is Loving Your Enemies at the Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Here's a picture of it. In downtown Montgomery, you'll notice it's on the hill, and then it's. Uh, I chose this picture because it's uh, all the buildings around it. There's a building on the left side that you don't see. It's across the street, but it's again, it's a red brick, um, and uh, they had already finished when he gave this speech in, in '57, and um, in they'd already finished the Montgomery bus riot. And so now Martin Luther King is known as a national leader because of uh, the Christian leadership group leading the bus boycott and Rosa Parks. And we talked about her before. Now, the key aspect that I wanted you to uh, understand about this positioning is that in this sermon, as in the last sermon, you would never know that he is this national leader of the civil rights or well, going to be that. These are, uh, I'm your pastor. These are fundamental Christian things that I'm preaching on, and I'm giving you the essence of Christianity. The text that I used to analyze was the third version of this sermon, Loving Your Enemies. He actually gave over 20 times. Uh, different varieties, and no two were this, were alike. It's not that he memorized them, but he kept a wonderful file of all of his sermons, and he had another big file of, of things he could use as to, to create the sermon. The theme here, again, I'm using the theme in the gospel, and these are two ways that can help you listen to sermons, trying to define that. And he says, loving your enemies is the fundamental Christian challenge. In the gospel, and this is by way, I wrote the word intro in here just to remind us that this was from the very first paragraph of the speech. He starts off like most, a lot of sermons do when they're talking about the gospel. You'll either start completely with a quotation from the gospel or they'll work it into the opening intro, a part of the intro. Love your enemies. This was from Matthew. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you and pray for them despite beside the despitefully use you, okay? And so you begin uh, to get a sense of where this sermon is going. Key part, the first part of this, if you're loving your enemies, you start with yourself. In order to love your enemies, you must begin by analyzing yourself. I'm aware of the fact that some people will not like you. Some people aren't going to like you because your skin is a little brighter than theirs, and others aren't going to like you because your skin is a little darker than theirs. Notice how this is audience adaptation because it's a black church that he's talking to. And so that becomes what he wants you to, to realize 
and he's talking about the variants. And they, then he gives a whole different list of things that they'll hate you for, your hair, your, uh, your place in society, uh, all sorts of things. This is divided into two parts in terms of loving your enemies. He talks about the international conflicts that lead to hate. The interesting thing here is that he jumps to the international. He doesn't talk about the hate that's in the civil rights aspect. He doesn't talk about the hate that they ran into in the Montgomery voice bus boycott. Uh, and actually, I was surprised that he didn't. But then when, it, when I was from reading other sermons and stuff, this period of the early king, he was like he was in your church. He could be a good shepherd, says, what do you need to know as uh, this congregation? And I'm talking to you, and this is part of the service, part of our Christian education. Why is hate bad? Uh, hate cuts off options when we act on hate. Love creates options. So you have this wonderful dichotomy uh, of love and hate, or two opposites, uh, yin and yang in the, in the Asian uh, tradition. We often run into these, and he uses this well in the sermons. His answer is we have to discover the elements of good in your enemy. And he finds that people really stumble over this, that it's very, very difficult. I cannot love my neighbor if I don't have a sense of what is good about them. And one thing that's good about them is God loves them also. Um, he creates his own cr credibility. I mentioned that earlier, but this is often the thing that many people miss um, in King and he gives his classic education, he quotes Ovid, he quotes Plato, he quotes Goethe, and he has the Apostle Paul in the develop to deal with that, all dealing with the importance of recognizing the good in your enemy. He defines the three types of love in Greek, the eros, philia, and agape, the, and he develops a full paragraph to each of those, and he talks about the difference, and he knows that he's really talking about agape. Why love? And this is a, 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 an essential part of this sermon, and I think gives its distinctiveness and why it was so popular. Why love? Well, he says that hate produces violence. Violence creates more violence. And then we have an unending chain of violence, and this is why King was noted for his uh, adoption of Gandhi's nonviolent non resistance uh, methods of being able to have marches and not to uh, attack or destroy or injure other people. And a lot of the training for the early marchers was on this. He also argues, and I think this is, a, to me, was the very strength of, a, of this sermon, is that hate distorts the personality of the hater. Love has within it a redemptive quality. And these two themes here, that uh, you, if you hate somebody, you suffer because it distorts your personality. And if you follow the Christian example of love, you have a redemptive quality. You change, okay? Now, what I put here in this note is that it all are based on the individual. He's talking about loving your enemies as an individual, something you do when you leave church. He was already a national leader. King is yet focusing on the person in the pews, not collective action. And, and that makes, again, the power of this as a sermon. So in the dramatic storytelling, he has a personal example that he actually used in many different sermons but this is such a great example that when I read it the first time, I says, I'll never forget it. And, and when I'm driving, I don't forget it. He's talking about a very dark night when he and his brother were going someplace between two cities. And his brother was driving and he's sitting in the front seat. And his brother is getting angry and getting angrier because people are not dimming their lights. So that's a very common thing that we can all identify with. You know, when you're driving at night, people aren't dimming their lights. We remember this is the 50s. They don't have automatic uh, systems on the cars back then. And so his brother was, his brother finally expressed, he says, there's, uh, he's going to leave his lights on bright and fix them. 
And Martin Luther King responds, oh, no, don't do that. That's too much light. There'd be too much light on the highway and it'll end up in mutual destruction for all. And so that's what I remember. What, what's hate going to do? Well, you know, I might be destroyed to be able to deal with that. Another startling example he uses is in the creation of heroes, which again is part of the black church rhetoric. And he has a, a, a long section, probably about three or four minutes, where he chooses the example of Stanton. And he quotes Stanton on, when he was deriding and hates Lincoln. He actually said that, he hated Lincoln. And, and he gave speech after speech why people should not vote for Lincoln. So Lincoln becomes president, sees the good in his secretary of war for strengths that he had, and Stanton later on uh, comes to admire Lincoln and realize that Lincoln's not a bad guy after all. And um, when Lincoln was assassinated, um, Stanton is often quoted because he said that Lincoln, it, now he is one for the ages. And uh, that was very true. He became a strong admirer. So this was his example of what you see the good in others and you don't hate them, even though they hate you you can become a good Christian. In the conclusion of the sermon, uh, he, he has a wonderful thing that Jesus is somewhere up on a mountain and, and he looks down and he sees the Roman army going by and he admires its, its power, its strength. And at the same time, he said, because you see, it's based on violence and you're only going to get more violence. And I'm Pe and Jesus who is pre preaching love, love our neighbors, love our neighbors as ourselves. And, and yet this wonderful contrast, Martin Luther King notes that Jesus's army grew from 11 or 12 men to 700 million people today. That's just a very startling statistic and I thought it was a good way. Then he again showing his growing up in the Christian church he cites three different hymns and uh, he gives uh, two of them. He gives the verses. The other one he paraphrases just to, to show you why love for Jesus, love for others is so important to being a Christian. And his claim in his conclusion is I would rather die than hate you. And he finishes with a prayer. This is kind of, this is another reason choosing this sermon. He generally doesn't do that, but this was uh, an example of how that, that was a sermon. So I, I reached a point where I, I've given you some overviews of two different sermons. And now I want to return to my sub theme was how do you listen? Okay. And so I'm suggesting this morning when you're listening to the sermon uh, that you try to take two things one is to identify the main idea, the theme, or your centering point, what you think is uh, the essential part of the sermon. Uh, the reason I put in a little phrase here, which you don't see in, in many uh, discussions of speaking, is a centering point. And my argument here is that as a listener, your centering point uh, may be in one of the examples. And for, for example, for example, uh, for this example, um, in today, the, the sermon when he takes the second one, when he uses the example of his brother and he driving, and that becomes a centering point because he uses that image, is expecting you, and I imagine most people would remember that image is why we shouldn't hate our neighbor. And so uh, that it's a centering point. It may not be the, what the main concept or the main idea of the sermon itself. The second thing that you might look for is in the gospel is to identify any other scripture or idea. And let me give you two things that I think are, are very helpful in listening to sermons. Um, and again, uh, <laughs> My wife and I did some uh, focus groups at Good Shepherd on, uh, we were very lucky at, that we were able to do this. And, and we asked people right afterwards, rather than going coffee hour to, to join us, in, in, and then I asked them, what did you remember about the sermon? And um, 
people were, were, were struggling, even though that they knew that they were going into that group. And then they started realizing, well, there was this idea or this quotation or this source or this, whatever, that, that relates to me. And, you know, maybe it's a quotation from Matthew or John uh, that was part of the theme of the, of the presentation. So now here are the two things. One is to first identify these two ideas or three, whatever you want to, to be able to work with. Ask yourself at the end of the sermon, now you're, you've got a few seconds before we start the creed, you have a, ask yourself, what are these things that I'm going to remember? Then the second big idea is to talk with your family when you're driving home or talk to somebody in the, in the hour. What did you remember about the sermon? Because you've already told yourself, so when they ask you, say, mm, uh, well, what did you remember? You have two or three things that you can share with them. That triggers your brain in order to, to try to, to work with uh, the situation. So in your discussion groups, uh, I put three questions. You can choose anything you want, to, whichever way your group wants to go. Uh, one of those, uh, is uh, what makes it hard to love your enemies? And that is uh, part of what he develops in, in, in a lot of details, but we should discuss that. What makes it hard uh, to love our, our enemies? And uh, you have a whole string of just, you know, maybe a neighbor, uh, my neighbor in, in, uh, when I was going to Good Shepherd sued me, for example. So it was hard to find that what was good about him developing to because I, I had to go to court to defend myself and um it, but the other way to do that is when you think of someone with whom you've had a conflict what is good about that person how do you apply king's uh theme of loving your neighbors when you try to deal with that and um then uh or you might ask yourself what are some of the dramatic stories that you remember uh, I'm I'm a Lincoln file sort of person, and so the the Stan thing was something I read about, heard about, and it was a major part of that. But I was the, the first time I've heard that story within a sermon, and how King developed that as a way to to love your neighbors. So those are three questions to get you started, and I hope you have a good discussion group. Uh, we will go on to next week on two sermons that will be from his middle period of his life.